<clears throat> Greetings, my name is Lucas Mann, and I'm the pastor of the Spring Church here in Lawrence, just about five miles from here, in fact, in Lawrence, South Carolina. And friends, I come out here this afternoon with my friend John to bring to you the gospel of grace, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, to share with you the message of life. Friends, see, we, we know that the Bible says that man, by default, is at enmity with God and is at war with God and needs to be reconciled, needs to be at peace with God. And we know that Scripture also says that is only accomplished through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, friends, it is our heart's desire, it is our goal this afternoon to bring to you the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace. Paul said in Romans 1.18, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Friends, it does not matter what your ethnic background is or how much money you make or what your place is in society. The gospel is the gospel for all. The Lord Christ is King of all. In fact, uh, He is the King over all people. Whether or not they believe in Him, whether or not they embrace Him, Christ is their King. Christ is your King, friends. And that is why the call of the gospel is that you submit to the One who rules over you already. That you submit to the King of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died upon that cross there those 2,000 years ago and bore the wrath of God against the sins of the people of God and was raised on the third day. Hallelujah! And all who embrace Him, all who come to Him, will have life eternal and will be freed from the bondage to sin, from slavery to the fear of death. For Christ is a powerful Savior. And assurance of salvation only comes because of what the Lord Jesus has done. Friends, your trust is either right now in yourself or it is in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Either you're right now on the road to destruction, the road to damnation, the road to hell, or you're on the road to life, the narrow path unto life. Jesus said there are few who find this narrow path and that ought to cause you to fear God, that ought to cause you to reverence the Holy One and be all the more diligent to seek after the true God, to seek after Yahweh, to seek after the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Friends, we want to warn you about sin. We want to warn you about hell, about the impending judgment for the wicked. That God will one day deal with the ungodly. That God is storing up wrath for the wicked. And that ought to cause the wicked to fear indeed. Paul told the unrepentant in Romans 2.5, he said, Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Friends, we're here to warn you about the impending wrath of God. But that Christ, the good news is that Christ bore the wrath of God for His people and they will never be lost. He died for His sheep, for His church, And He will bring about their salvation. That He has already brought about their salvation. And will impl uh, will the, the Spirit of God will apply the benefit of His work to the hearts of those people. But that never removes the responsibility of the sinner. That's why it is our plea with you, our plea before you, that you would repent and believe upon Christ. We care for your soul. We care for where you're going to go when you die. We care for your eternal state. Will it be in the place of torment for the wicked? 
the place of punishment for the ungodly, or will it be in the place of bliss, a blissful rest for the righteous in glory? I cannot answer for each and every one of you. Certainly I cannot. Only each man can answer for himself. And that is why God will deal justly with each person according to what they have done. And friends, if you are a human being, of course you are. Well, then we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all fallen in Adam. We all inherit that original sin, that sinful nature. And therefore, we all need a Savior. We all need Christ the Lord. Sin is great, yes. The wrath of God is to be feared, yes. But Christ is a great Savior. And He saves from these things by His grace and for His glory. And ultimately... We come out here this afternoon to bring glory to God. God is glorified in the preaching of the Gospel of His Son. He's exalted as His grace is magnified. As Christ is offered to sinners, to poor sinners. Many of you have much in this world. Many possessions. But friends, if you have not Christ, you are poor. Spiritually poor, miserable and wretched, and you're, you're, all the earthly riches, riches that you have amassed will all burn, will all be done away with. When you die, it's all over. And that is why we ought not live for this life, but for the life which is to come. For once we pass out of this life, we are in eternity. Either in eternal torment or eternal rest in the presence of God. So as I said, may, may God be glorified as the Gospel is preached in the open air by His grace. The text of Scripture I would like to look at this afternoon is found in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 3, in verse 20, the beginning half, the, the first half of verse 20. And Paul is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And he writes... Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. Thank you for your cards to do this. Oh, thank you. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. He says, Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. Very short, very concise, and very clear. The text has spoken. No man by his own power and merit will bring himself unto God. No man by the works of his hands, the labor and the toil of his arms, can pull himself up to heaven, can reconcile himself to God, can possibly cover the vast, the vast distance that is between God and man the vast chasm that is fixed between them because of sin. No man by what he does or thinks or says can bring himself to a state of right standing with God. This is of course why Christ's work is so necessary. Jesus did not come as an option. It was Jesus' work wasn't an option. It was absolutely indispensable. It was absolutely necessary to come about. It had to happen if we were to ever be saved. If any sinner was to ever be pardoned, if any ungodly soul was ever to be allowed to enter into glory, Christ had to step down from His exalted position and veil His glory and die and rise again. He had to. Sin is so horrible, my friends. Sin is so bad. Friends, you must understand this, that you must understand your sin before you can understand the grace of the Savior. You must see the fearfulness, the, 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 the terror of being outside of Christ, of being under the wrath of God, so that you can see how gracious God has been in providing salvation for His Son. If one only looks at the grace of God as it is revealed in Christ, one will not value it very much. We must see the bad news before we can hear the good news. 
In fact, I say if you haven't properly understood your sinful state before God, then you're not ready to hear the message of the cross. First, let the heart of man be broken by the the shattering power of the hammer of God's law. Let them first be broken over their sin so that they can have hope in the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the works of the law. God's law was never given as the means for our salvation. Never was it given, my friends. It was there to show us our sin so that we look to the perfect law keeper, so that we look to Christ, the perfect, sufficient, powerful Savior. So I want to consider these truths as I go through this text this afternoon, as I preach to you from this passage, and ultimately I want it to lead us to the Gospel because this strips us of hope, this strips us of self-righteousness when we consider these realities and brings us in humility before the cross of Calvary so that we might be able to say in agreement with the hymn writer, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross of Christ I cling. But before we consider these truths and ultimately the Gospel itself, we must contemplate briefly the context of this verse where Paul has come from and where he is going in in the book of Romans. In Romans 3, he's summarizing really all that he's spoken of in Romans 2 and some of Romans 1, that both religious and non-religious, Jew and Greek, all people are under sin. Because all people have broken the law of God, they've sinned against that which they know to be right. They've sinned against the, the general revelation that they've been given, the, 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 the knowledge of God's attributes, God's moral standard of judgment, God's moral standard of righteousness. That's why he says in verse 9, What then, uh, this is chapter 3, verse 9, What then are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And then he gives a lengthy, a lengthy series of quotations from the Old Testament. In verses 10 through 18. Then he says in verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. So all the world, not a single person is exempt from this. It is is the whole entirety of the human race that is under the condemning power of the law. That is under the condemnation of sin. There is not one person that is exempt from that. Not one soul that is exempt from being stained by the filth of iniquity. These are pretty sobering realities. These are depressing realities. They strip us of any self-righteousness or hope in ourselves. What is the purpose? What is the purpose of the Apostle Paul doing that in these verses? Well, he says in verse 21, we find a transition. He says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. So Paul is 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 bracing the sinner, bracing the reader for what they are about to hear by bringing to them the bad news. He takes the weight of God's law and places it upon their back so that when they see the Gospel, that yoke is thrown off and they take upon themselves the yoke of the Lord Jesus Christ which is light and easy to bear. And so therefore, let's zoom in on verse 20. Let's consider that by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. It's precisely what the text says, verse 20. So He has just said in verse 19 that the law speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. What is the reason for this? Verse 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in His sight. By the works of the law, that is, keeping God's law. We cannot do it, my friends. In fact, I challenge and ask any of you, 
Have you kept God's law perfectly as He demands? Have you walked in holiness without which no one will see the Lord? Certainly not. Certainly you have not. I have not. Have you loved the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength? And have you loved your neighbor as yourself? If not, then you have trampled God's law on your foot. You've broken His commands. And you stand guilty, guilty, guilty. The heavenly hosts, in agreement with the law of God, cry out, guilty. Your own conscience cries out, guilty. And that is why Christ came to save us from our sins, even to save us from a defiled conscience. A conscience which screams at us and tells us that we have sinned against God and we deserve hell for our sin. Such a troubled conscience can only be eased by the healing balm of the Gospel. By the message of the cross that Christ suffered upon that cross for those very sins that we have committed. And so therefore we can rest knowing that the Father has pardoned us, has pardoned His people justly. That He has graciously saved His people, but that is never to the exclusion of His justice, but rather in beautiful harmony and in agreement with His justice. By the works of the law, it says no flesh... That is a term that is used elsewhere in Scripture. That is, no humankind, not a single human being, can possibly be justified before God by their works. Let no man deceive you concerning this, friends, that you cannot be reconciled to God. You cannot be made right with God through your work, through your religious performance. Otherwise, that nullifies the work of Jesus Christ. Even if the Roman Catholic Church, that system of blasphemy against the Lord Jesus Christ, which says that salvation is by works, do not believe them, believe the Scriptures. Or Jehovah's Witnesses or, or Mormons will tell you that it is faith and works. Certainly not. It is faith alone. In fact, right now, this month of October, 500 years ago in, in Germany, a monk by the name of Martin Luther, 500 years ago, on October 31st, went to the castle church door there in Wittenberg, Germany, and nailed the 95 Theses. And therefore, it began the Protestant Reformation, where God graciously raised up men of the faith, men of renown, to lead His people out of the, of the blasphemous system of the Roman Catholic Church. And so let us not be so foolish or so prideful as to think that we are good enough to do that. We are not. It says, no flesh will be justified in His sight. This excludes all future events. It's not just that no one in the past has ever been justified by their work, but even no one in the future, no one by their own ingenuity or their own wit will ever bring themselves into a right standing before the Creator by their performance. It excludes any idea or inkling of such a concept. Notice it says, in His sight. My friends, God's eyes see your wicked things. The wicked things that you do and think and say. The sexually immoral things that you do in secret, God keeps record of. His eyes roam to and fro about the earth. He sees all things. There is not a single thing that is apart. from the watchful eye of God. Hebrews 4.13 says it this way, And there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are open and laid bare before the, uh, excuse me, laid bare to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Friends, God sees your wicked deeds and you've got to deal with this God. You may suppress that truth in your unrighteousness, as Paul says in Romans 1.18, but friends, you still must deal with this God. But friends, I tell you something glorious. 
that there is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ, as the book of Hebrews says, lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the eternal, everlasting God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And certainly, my friends, your sin is great. Absolutely, you are a vile sinner. But friends... Christ is a glorious Savior and a sufficient Savior and a powerful Savior. They are. They will not be justified in His sight. Who is this God who is omnipresent, who is all places? at all times. He is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One in three and three in one. One being in essence in nature. Yet three co-eternal, co-existent persons. And this God is three times holy. He is the Holy One of Israel. Righteous in all His ways. Perfect in all His deeds. Psalm 19.8 says, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God's commands are pure because He Himself is pure. That is, that He possesses perfect moral purity to the uttermost. In fact, I could use the phrase, God is good. Now, I'm not referencing His disposition, but His actual moral faculties. Perfect, my friends. In no way sinful. He is holy, sanctified. That is, He is set apart from all that is wicked all that is perverse and all that is ungodly, all that is evil. God has no fellowship with wickedness, no fellowship with darkness. God told the Israelites in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, He said, I am the Lord who brought you up from the hand, or excuse me, from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. Friends, we have lost in our sinfulness, in the sinful nature that we have inherited from Adam, we have lost the sins of the holiness of God. In fact, we are automatically, by default, idol builders. We, we make false gods in our own hearts and minds that suit our desires and our lusts. But my friends, Scripture stands in opposition to our idolatrous and disgusting thoughts. Scripture says, The Lord is holy. He is a holy God. He is righteous and just in all His ways. Perfect. And how precious it is to know that God is gracious as well. God is merciful. He holds back from sinners that which they deserve. To consider the reality that we ourselves are not right now in the, in the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, the place of hell, my friends, is a glorious miracle of grace. It's a precious gift of grace from God. The fact that you are not in hell speaks to the mercy of God. God is also love. 1 John 4, 8 tells us that. God is love, and we're going to see later on how that love was manifested toward His particular people. But to speak of God's grace, it's interesting. In Matthew 5, the Lord Jesus paints this picture very clearly. The Lord Jesus talks about how the Father's sins reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. He said in Matthew 5, 44, He said to His followers, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. 
For He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Oh, my friends, God certainly is gracious. But don't let that be something you trample underfoot. Do not take God's grace and turn it into a license for sin. Do you not become licentious, friends? For the wrath of God will be multiplied against you. Instead, let the kindness of God, as Paul says in Romans 2.4, lead you to repentance. Lead you to flee your sin and your sexual immorality and your pride and to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Do not let that be about God. Or do not let that which is about His character that ought to move you to repentance, do not allow that. Do not cause it actively to become something you trample underfoot. For His wrath will soon be poured out upon you for such evil. God is so holy. And God in His holiness has given us His commands, His holy law. As I just read out of Psalm 19, the commandment of the Lord is pure. God gave us His Ten Commandments. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not blaspheme. You shall not commit adultery. These commands given in Exodus 20, later reiterated in Deuteronomy, later in the New Testament as well, speak to the holiness of God. They show us His character. They show us His moral perfections. Why does God condemn murder? Why does God condemn stealing? God's not a murderer. God's not a thief. He owns all things. He has divine prerogative to tell us what we ought to do with that which He owns. But my friends, when we see God's law, not only do we see His character, but our sinful character. We see our sin in light of His righteousness. For when we consider the command, you shall not lie. Have you ever lied, friends? Have you ever bore false witness that, friends, you've sinned against God? You've brought that guilt upon you and you've got to stand before the Holy One on the Day of Judgment. The book of Revelation tells us all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. Have you ever stolen something? Friends, you brought that guilt upon you. You ever committed adultery? You say, no. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. My friends, God sees the mind. He sees the heart. And He sees that it is perverse, that it has been tainted by sin, that it is not good. Man does not have inherent goodness. Man does not have inherent righteousness. We see it all around us. Really, we don't even need the Scriptures to convince, of this, uh, convince us of this reality because it is so clearly all around us that it would be foolish to deny its truthfulness. My friends, we have trampled God's law underfoot and we have become accountable to God because of that. Because of our law breaking. Just as a murderer or a rapist here in South Carolina... <coughs> Excuse me deserves to be held accountable for their law breaking, deserves for a magistrate to, to condemn them for their law breaking. So too do we before God, the Holy One, deserve to be judged for our sin. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says it very clearly. It says, For all of us, have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. How true that is, my friends, that our sin before God takes us away. It brings us into a standing before Him that is a standing of condemnation, that is a position of enmity and strife with God. War with God. There is no neutrality with Jesus Christ. There is no neutrality with the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in a, either an enemy of the cross or you are the friend of God. Friends, the only way that one can obtain peace with God 
is through the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that a sinner, as evil as yourselves and as evil as me, can possibly be reconciled to an infinitely holy God is if God Himself intercedes. And the Lord Jesus Christ is that perfect intercessor, that perfect mediator of the new covenant, the covenant of grace. But oh friends, how true that is that our iniquities do like the wind take us away. And therefore we are all, without exception, without exemption, condemned to the place that Jesus described more than He described heaven. Jesus spoke on this place more than He did about heaven because He wanted to warn sinners of its terror. Jesus described it as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of torment for the wicked. The place called hell, my friends. Guiana is the word that Jesus often used in the New Testament. It's very interesting. That word referred to a a particular place outside of Jerusalem in ancient Israel where they would burn trash and burn dead bodies and had a continually burning fire. It was, a, it was basically a public dump. And they would just burn everything that they did not use. All the garbage. And Jesus uses that term that was given to that place to describe hell. Hell is a place of unquenchable fire. A place of torment, my friends, for the wicked. A place of outer darkness. And my friends, I care, you, I care for you enough to warn you about this. A place where you perhaps are on the way to if you know not the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be many on the day of judgment who will look to Christ and say, Lord, Lord! And He will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, what a terrifying position to be in. But my friends, we are all in that state of being on the road to destruction. And there is no hope. We cannot work our way out of this. It is not as if our souls are somewhat tainted by sin and we just need to overcome that evil by our good. Going back to the text, Romans 3.20, By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. Not a single person by their own materious works and actions can possibly bring themselves unto God. In fact, it's an offense unto God to present our righteous deeds, as Isaiah 64, 6 says, that are are filthy rags to Him as the basis for our justification. It's an offense to God to try and bring up your own good deeds as the basis for your salvation. Just as a convicted murderer and rapist here in South Carolina, if they stood before a judge and they said, Judge, let me off the hook. I've done good things in my life. And I promise I'm going to treat women good from now on. They say, I promise I will do right from now on out. Therefore, could you forgive me? It would be an offense because justice has not been brought about. Justice has not been carried out. And friends, it is the same way with God, only more so. He is jealous for holiness. He is jealous for justice. As Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God is jealous for justice. It's interesting, there's been a recent movement, social justice warriors as they're called, trying to establish justice on the earth. But my friends, the only way true justice will ever be accomplished is by looking unto the Lord God, the one who is the righteous judge of all the earth. And really, they do not want justice upon their own souls. They don't want justice from God, otherwise they'll be in hell. They want mercy, they want grace. They want Christ to have had taken that punishment upon Himself, not they themselves in hell. And so therefore we are all hopeless, truly. However, the good news of the Gospel is that God in eternity past, the Father, in His grace and in His love toward His people, 
predestined them to glory, set apart a, a people unto Himself, His church. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 1, concerning the Father in verse 4, he says, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will. So herein do we find the love of God, that in eternity past He decided from the whole lot of the human race to set aside a people unto Himself. And then He covenanted with the Son, the Lord Christ, to come and die for this miserable band of sinners to bear the judgment that they deserve and then to be raised on the third day to be exalted in glory to receive the full reward of His sufferings and Christ agreed, Christ obeyed and submitted to the perfect will of His Father. And even the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, joyfully agreed to come and equip Christ to do what He did in His perfect life and then to apply the benefit of His work to the hearts of, peop of the people of God. How glorious it is to consider that the triune God has set out from eternity past to bring about salvation for His own glory. So when the fullness of the times came, as Galatians 4.4 4 says, Christ Jesus was born under the law, born of a virgin, and He came and fulfilled the law of God that we broke. He kept the commands that we have trampled underfoot. He lived in perfect submission and in perfect obedience to the will of the Father. Jesus Himself said in Matthew 5.17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And that is precisely what He did, my friends. Jesus in His earthly ministry said the two most important commands are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you are to love your neighbor as yourself. And the rest of the commands are built off of these two. What's very interesting is not a single person can possibly for even a split second, no one has ever or ever will in the, in the whole history of the human race ever keep these, these commands perfectly other than the man Christ Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Something we simply cannot do. But praise be to God that Jesus Christ in all the entirety of His life, every moment, was in perfect submission to these two commands and fulfilled them. And then He was so brutally murdered, unjustly nailed to a Roman cross, made a public mockery. He was humiliated. The, the Creator God hanging upon the cross, being mocked by His creation. And upon that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Upon the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ took ownership of the sins of His people. That is, that the Father called upon the Lord Christ, as it were, to now at that moment and, that, and at that time to take ownership of the sins of the people of God. To be our substitute. First Peter 4 1 says, Christ has suffered in the flesh. He suffered such great torments we can possibly. We cannot possibly fathom the horror of his sufferings. And not only to speak of that, but also of His spiritual sufferings, that upon that cross, the wrath, the infinite wrath of God against the sins of His people was unleashed upon Christ, was poured out on Christ, so that as Isaiah 53.10 says, it pleased the Lord to crush Him. How glorious that is. And then it continues, if He would render Himself as a guilt offering. My friends, that is absolutely glorious. Christ died as the guilt offering for us. And upon that cross when He cried out, Tetelestai, that is, it is finished. The wrath of the Father was perfectly, perfectly satisfied. 
to use the biblical term, it was propitiated. That is, that it was absorbed and it was done away with. And there is not an ounce left for the people of God to take upon themselves. So God can be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God legally brought about the access into His presence that His people so desperately needed. Isaiah 52, verse 9, Break forth, shout joyfully together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted His people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared His holy arm in the sight of all the nations, that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. Christ Jesus died publicly that's the term that Paul uses later on in Romans 3. God displayed Him publicly as a propitiation. It was, it was outright. It was so that all people might see the salvation of our God. And Christ not only died, but He was raised on the third day. The Father did that to show us that His sacrifice was well-pleasing in His sight. That the death of His Son was so perfect and, and so pleasing unto Him that He will gladly gladly and justly forgive the sins of His people by His grace for His glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah unto the triune God that Jesus Christ is alive today and forevermore, never to die again. Death has no power over Him, my friends. He is the true God and eternal life. And there is no God but the Lord Christ. And after 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, Christ then went to the top of the Mount of Olives there outside of Jerusalem and ascended bodily into glory. And as Hebrews 1.3 says, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high having completed the work of salvation once for all. That the work of redemption has been accomplished. Christ has fully bought salvation for His people by His precious blood. And the call of the Gospel, the call unto the sinner, is not one of, well, you must simply try your best now to be saved. Jesus has done 99% and you must do your 1%. The call of the Gospel is that we must repent and believe it. Repentance and faith. Jesus presented this in Mark 1.15 at the outset of His ministry. He said, The time is fulfilled and the Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel. My friends, that is the call of the Gospel. That is what the sinner must do to enter into, into, enter into the new covenant, to, to reap the benefits of Christ's work, one must repent and believe. Repentance is a change of mind. A change of mind concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning Christ. It is a brokenness over sin, a disgust of sin, and a fleeing from sin. A fleeing from pornography. A fleeing from drunkenness. Another sexual immorality of fleeing from drug abuse and pride and selfishness, worldliness, of fleeing from foul language, and it believing comes right alongside repentance. And belief is confidence in the Word of God, confidence in the promises of God, confidence in the truth of the Gospel, that it is sufficient to save. And repentance and faith, even themselves, are gifts from God. Are gifts of grace from God unto the sinner. My friends, and for those who will repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father will forgive them of all sin, past, present, and future, as Jesus said in Luke 24. The Father will forgive them of all their rebellion. All of the iniquities that they have ever committed. This is the love of God, my friends. This is how gracious... The God of glory is. He will forgive all the sins of His people because He has justly put forth Christ as a propitiation for their sin. 
Not only is the love and mercy of God revealed in the Gospel, but the holy righteousness of God is revealed in the Gospel. That God does not sweep sin under the rug. He does not arbitrarily forgive it. He must have just pay, a payment made in order for sin to be forgiven. And friends, you will be forgiven of all your sins if you repent and believe the Gospel. I can promise you that because I am standing upon the promises of the Word of God Most High. I have nothing to tell you aside from what the Scriptures say. I have nothing to say aside from what the Word of the Most High God has to say. The infallible, inspired, inerrant Word of the living God that has been preserved throughout the ages so that sinners might be saved and saints might be edified in the gospel of grace. And not only will the sinner be forgiven of their sin, not only will you be forgiven of your sin, but you, my friend, if you repent and believe, will be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. That is, you will be credited with having lived Jesus' life because Christ, if, he, if you are His, was credited with having lived your life. That's the exchange of the Gospel. That Christ takes my sin and I receive His righteousness. Christ takes my filthy garments of, of iniquity and I receive His perfect righteousness unto my account. So that when the Father sees me, He sees Christ. Because when He looked upon Christ, He regarded Him as if He had committed the sin that I've committed. This is glorious, my friends, and it is all by grace. That's why Paul says in Romans 5.1, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. This is truly glorious, my friends. Salvation is by all 100% of the grace of God. It is not by the work of man. It is not by the merit or the effort of man. It is by God's free grace. God's unmerited favor. God's riches at Christ's expense. And I will briefly say this for those of you who are religious. Those of you who name the name of Christ... If you know Christ, you will bear fruit of conversion. The one who has been truly saved by God's grace will have now a new nature because they have been regenerated. They have been born again. They've been recreated. They've been made new. They've been born from above, born by the Spirit of God. Jesus said in John 3.3, 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Friends, if you are not born again, then you cannot see God's kingdom. That's why it is absolutely imperative that you are born again. The question is not, do you attend church? The question is not, do you seldom read your Bible? The question is not, do you sometimes pray? The question is not, are you in some way religious some part of the time? The question is not, do you even say that you know Christ? The question is, have you been born again? That is, has God given you a new nature with a new heart and new desires? See, friends, lost people live in sin because that is their nature. It is according to that which is their nature. They love iniquity. They love unrighteousness. They love unholiness. They love impurity. They love pornography. They love drunkenness because they are lost. But for the child of God who has been born again, for the child of God who has been saved, they now have a new nature. They love the Word of God. They love the fellowship of the saints. They love to share the good news with those who are lost. They delight in these things because God has done a work in their heart. My friends, when someone is saved, it is radical. God does a, a work in their life. They are made new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 uses this radical terminology. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old, thing, the old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. If you say you are a Christian... 
If you say that you know Christ, maybe you even attend church, my question for you is, do you walk in righteousness? Do you delight in the truth of God? Our works are not the cause of salvation, but the fruit of it. The evidence of it. We do not work to be saved. We work because we have been saved. Friends, if you say that you know Jesus Christ, I ask you to go to the Word of God and to examine yourself in light of what the Word of God has to say concerning salvation. Go to the book of 1 John and read it and examine yourself. Do you love the brethren? Do you love God? Not just, oh yeah, I love God. Who doesn't? The question is, do you by your life say that you love God by your actions? Actions speak louder than words, as the old phrase goes. And that is very true, friends. Many have made professions of faith in churches here in America. Even in this very county, there are many churches, many people who say they know Christ, but they are lost, friends. They are on the road to destruction. There are many on the day of judgment, as Jesus said in Matthew 7, who will say unto Him, Lord, Lord! But Jesus says in Matthew 7.21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Do you love the things that God loves or do you, or, and do you hate the things that God hates? Have you been given a new nature? And the Gospel, I'll say this, if you, if you look at yourself and you examine yourself in light of the truth of Scripture and you see that you have been truly saved and God's done a work in your heart, praise be to God. But if you see that you are lost, I encourage you to repent and believe the Gospel. I encourage you to repent and believe the Gospel. But if you know Christ, then I will say this, the Gospel is for the child of God to feed upon and rest upon daily and for us to preach to the lost daily the daily Gospel which sustains and sanctifies. It's all by grace, my friends. All by the unmerited favor of God. All by the free grace of God. Hallelujah unto God indeed. It is all for the glory of God. All things are for the glory of God. God has made this world. He has made you. He has made me. He has sent His Son into the world to redeem sinners for His own glory, to bring praise and honor to His holy name. It is all for the glory of God. That's why Paul said in Romans 11, 33, he said, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen and amen. Indeed, to God be all glory forever and ever. Amen. You who are lost, you who are pagans, who know not Christ, Embrace the Lord Jesus. You who are religious, examine yourself to see whether you know Christ. If not, flee to the cross. And if so, glory to God. You who know the Lord Christ, rest and feed upon the Gospel every day and share it with those who are lost by the grace of God and for the glory of God. So we've seen here in Romans 3.20, the beginning part of this verse, that by works, by the works of the law, no person will be justified in God's sight. No man, no woman, no child. We are all condemned before God. But Christ came into the world to save sinners. We all deserve hell for our sin because we broke God's law. But Christ came and lived and died and rose again for sinners to save them. And all who repent and believe Him will be saved by the grace of God and for the glory of God. So to God be all glory in your life and in mine, and in all things as they redound to His glory, forever and ever, through Jesus Christ, Amen and Amen.